For the past 15 years, I have sent flowers to my wife on her birthday, which is actually a tradition that started when we were dating in college. And so a few weeks ago, I ordered two dozen roses to be delivered to her work on February 24th, last Thursday. And I ordered them from this really popular company. Uh, I'd heard great things about them, so I'm on Shark Tank. It's like, there's beautiful flowers, and they come from eco-friendly and sustainable farms. So I thought, that's a, that's a good thing to do. And so wanting to make sure they arrived on time, about two days before her birthday, I checked the tracking number to make sure everything looked good. And everything was on time. But then her birthday came. And you can probably guess where this is going. The morning of her birthday, this company called me to let me know that the flowers wouldn't be delivered until the 25th, which is not her birthday. And so I contacted the company to see if there's anything they could do, um, but they essentially said, hey, it's, it's out of our hands. In fact, they kept saying things like, this is not normal for us, and the next time this happens, we'll make sure it doesn't actually happen, which didn't make me feel better at all. I didn't care if they fixed it for the next person sending flowers to their spouse for the 15th year in a row. I wanted them to fix my problem right now. But there was nothing they could do, and of course, this didn't sit well with me. I'm pretty sure I was doing the whole chat thing, and I'm pretty sure while I'm like chatting with them, I'm screaming at my computer because I was so frustrated. And then I thought, I'm going to ruin them. I never said I was perfect. So I Googled how to destroy a flower company. And after digging through some things on Reddit, I figured that the best plan was to take them down from within. And so I decided to apply for a position in the company because I figured in three to five years, I'll work my way to the top and then I'll burn it all to the ground. (laughs) Then as I was updating my resume, because I've been here for five years, so I gotta make that uh, more relevant, I realized that Ray is at school probably expecting the flowers. And so I had to break the bad news to her, and I texted her and said, hey, I want to let you know that the flowers are delayed, and I'm just so sorry. And she texted back, destroy them. (laughs) No, she's too nice. She said, I still love you. And after that, I realized that I should probably stop focusing on destroying said flower company and get back to writing my sermon for this week that's on anger. (laughs) So today we're kicking off a new series called In My Feelings, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to dig in to some of the core emotions that we feel. Uh, And if I had to give this series like a genre, I would say this is a series on emotional intelligence uh, and emotional health. Emotional intelligence, or EQ, refers to the ability to identify and manage one's own emotions, as well as the ability to identify and understand someone else's. Emotional health is an aspect of mental health. It's our ability to cope with both positive and negative emotions. Emotionally healthy people have good coping mechanisms when dealing with negative emotions, uh, and they also know when it's gotten too far for them and they need to reach out for professional help. And so ultimately, that's, that's really the goal of this series, for us to grow in our emotional intelligence and kind of heal and grow in our emotional health. And I know that some of you are immediately uncomfortable because you don't like to talk about your feelings or your emotions. In fact, I know many of you, and some of you just pretend like you don't have those things. Um, But here's the truth. This is really deep. We all have emotions, okay? Actually, let's do it like this. Uh, If you're taking notes, write this down. We all have emotions, okay? It's on the slide, so now you have to take it as truth. Uh, We have emotions. They are a normal part of life. But as we also know, emotions are a tricky thing. And if we don't have the right tools for managing them, we will end up very unhealthy. So over the next few weeks, we're going to look at anger, worry, sadness, and joy. And we're going to learn what Jesus teaches about these feelings that we have. And we're going to look at how through Scripture we can have a healthy approach and understanding to these emotions. And so let's jump right in and start by talking about anger. Anger is one of the most complex emotions that we feel. The American Psychological Association says that anger is an emotion characterized by antagonism towards someone or something we feel has deliberately done us wrong. We tend to feel anger when we feel like we're being attacked or deceived or we're frustrated or maybe we feel like we're being invalidated. And what makes anger so tricky is that anger can actually be a good thing. Anger can help us identify problems or things that are hurting us. It can motivate us to create change or achieve our goals, uh, to move on from something. It can help us stay safe and defend ourselves in dangerous situations by giving us that burst of energy that's part of our fight or flight system. But anger can also be a bad thing. 
If you never develop healthy ways to express anger, it will have a negative impact on your overall mental and physical health. It can lead to destructive behaviors, and it can also block your ability to sense and recognize other people's emotions. And so naturally, uh, the Bible talks a lot about anger. In Ecclesiastes 7, it says, Control your temper, for anger labels you a fool. James 1.20 says, Human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Quite possibly, the most famous verses on anger are found in the book of Ephesians. Paul is writing to this church in Ephesus, and he's reminding them how to live like people who follow Jesus. And he says, stop living like unbelievers and start acting like people who've accepted, who've put on this newness of Christ. He says, stop giving into sin, don't lie, don't steal, don't use your words to hurt other people. But he also teaches it in Ephesians 4, starting in verse 26. This is what he says. He says, and don't sin by letting anger control you. And this is really important. Paul doesn't say, don't be angry. He says, don't let anger control you. Right? Don't let anger dictate how you treat other people, how you respond to stress, how you deal with conflict. Because when anger controls us, it leads to sin. Right? It will lead to the sin of unforgiveness. It will lead to bitterness and a hard heart. It could lead to gossip and slander or jealousy or the worst case scenario, it can lead to death and murder. And so we have to make sure that if we have anger, that that anger doesn't control us. And then Paul continues. He says, don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. Right? And a lot of people like, take this literally, like it can't be nighttime and I can't be angry, but that's not actually what he's saying. Um, it's actually in reference, and people who are Jewish would understand this. This is the idea of don't start a new day with that same anger. What, what he's saying in a paraphrase is deal with it. Right? Don't carry that anger into the next day and the next day and the next day, because the truth is the more you carry that anger, the harder it becomes to heal. I once heard someone say that anger is like a pressure cooker. And when you don't deal with it in a healthy way, it blows up. And what ends up happening is we get hurt mentally and emotionally and spiritually. That anger ends up hurting others. And then Paul finishes, it, finishes this part by saying this, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. Now, the word foothold in Greek means a place or room. That's what anger does. It gives a place for the devil. But it makes me think about rock climbing. Did any of you guys see the movie Free Solo that came out a few years ago? Uh, it's a documentary about a rock climber named Alex and his attempt to climb El Capitan alone without ropes, harnesses, or protective equipment. Um, I don't even know if this picture does it justice. And just so everybody's aware, uh, he, if he falls, he dies, okay? Uh, there's nothing holding him in. He doesn't die. Um, but also, if you have, like, anxiety in any way, don't watch this documentary. Um, it's terrifying because El Capitan is 3,200 feet tall, which is essentially like three Empire State Buildings stacked on top of each other. And he does this all by himself and if nothing to catch him if he falls. So again, he lives, but still terrifying. But as you watch this documentary, you'll see that there are certain parts uh, of the rock face that he gets to and he kind of pauses. And what he's doing is he's trying to map out his next few steps, his next few moves. And if you watch, he, he holds on with one arm and he has his foot planted on one and his other foot will start searching. And he'll start looking for a foothold, a place where he can put his foot to bear his weight, to push himself up so he can keep climbing, conquering the rock. So Paul says that anger is a foothold that Satan uses to gain ground in our life. It's a foothold that he uses to accomplish his goal that Jesus says in John 10.10 10, is to kill, steal, and destroy. And this foothold is probably the reason why so many marriages are struggling right now. It's probably why so many friendships are hurting because people are letting their anger drive them to sin. It's probably why so many of us don't have healthy relationships with our parents. So summing up what, Peter, or what Paul is saying, it's that anger isn't a sin, but unchecked anger will lead to it. Right? Anger in and of itself isn't a sin, but unhealthy anger and misplaced anger, unchecked anger will lead to sin. And so we are allowed to feel anger, which is a good thing. I feel it a lot, uh, not always in the healthiest ways. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But we're allowed to feel this emotion called anger. But how do we make sure it doesn't lead to sin? Right? What does healthy anger look like? 
Well, I think the best example of this comes uh, from a story about Jesus. Jesus was heading into Jerusalem right before Passover. And in the first century, essentially every Jewish person in the Roman Empire would travel to Jerusalem to celebrate this holiday. In fact, Jewish historian Josephus said there's typically about 40,000 people in Jerusalem, but during Passover, there would be a quarter of a million people there. Um, have you ever been downtown in September for In the Street? I imagine that, that this is what it feels like, right? There's people everywhere. It's crowded. You're shoulder to shoulder uh, for block. There's no parking. You can't get um, a seat at a table at a restaurant. Frederick becomes a whole different city on that day because people come from all over to downtown. And to understand Jesus' mindset, this was actually the last week of his life, and he knew it. In about five days, he was going to be put on a cross and executed for claiming to be the Son of God. And so Jesus is on edge a little bit, and it's understandable. And when he gets to Jerusalem, he walks into the temple, and what he saw broke his heart and made him angry. He saw greed. He saw hypocrisy. He saw abuse. He saw the misuse of the church. And so Jesus did something that was out of the ordinary for him, and out of his righteous anger, not a sinful anger, out of his godly anger, not a human anger, this is what happened in Matthew 21. Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out all the people buying and selling animals for sacrifice. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. And so you see, he's mad. He comes in, he starts flipping tables, he starts flipping chairs, he starts driving people out of the temple. Right? He was angry. And here's why. Jesus was angry because the money changers and the people selling doves were taking advantage of the Jewish people who were coming to worship and celebrate Passover. Scholars believe that the money changers who were there to exchange one currency for another, not, like if, not unlike if you went to another country, and they were charging a fee, which was normal, but they were actually charging a fee that was about three times what was customary. So they're taking advantage of people from other places with different currency, and they're pocketing the extra money for themselves. And the people selling doves were even worse. When you went to the temple to make a sacrifice, typically you'd bring two doves with you. And a fair price for those doves would have been four pence. But for the people who came without doves who had to buy them at the temple, they were being charged 75 pence. And so by doing these things, those who were marginalized didn't have the resources to take a sacrifice to the temple or give an offering. And Jesus didn't like that. He was upset. He was angry. People were hurting, or people were putting up barriers and stopping people from worshiping God. And so he said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple will be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. Jesus is actually quoting prophecies from Isaiah 56 and Jeremiah 7. And I don't think it's a stretch to think that Jesus said this a little louder than usual. Right, that he didn't have a soft and gentle tone because he was angry. People had turned the church, the temple, from a place of serving and caring for people to a place of taking advantage of people. And then Matthew, who writes this, actually adds this little sentence that feels a little bit out of place. In, in verse 14, he says, The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Now, this is actually a pretty controversial story, and people are very split on how to view it. I've actually heard Christians use this story to justify their anger. They use it as an out for dealing with their own anger issues and how they treat other people in response to their anger. They'll say, well, Jesus flipped tables, so I can do that thing. I've also heard Christians say that Jesus wasn't actually mad when he did all this, which just sounds weird to me. Imagine him like gently turning tables over, right? Like that's not a thing, you know, softly turning a chair. That's, that's not it. And the truth is neither argument is right. Jesus was angry, but he was also emotionally healthy. And so he handled his anger in a righteous way. And so what I want to do is I want us to look back through this story because there are three things that I want to point out that I believe that we can learn from Jesus when it comes to what healthy anger looks like. And these applications were actually majorly inspired by a pastor named Craig Rochelle. As I've been working to become emotionally healthy in regard to my own anger, I have come across a ton of great teaching from him. And when I heard him break down this story, I thought, man, I, I need that. And I imagine many of you will feel the same way. And so here's the first thing that he shared that we can learn from Jesus. Jesus wasn't angry about what others did to him. Jesus was angry about how others were mistreated. 
Right? Jesus wasn't offended about what somebody said about him or did to him, but his heart was breaking because of the mistreatment of others. Right? His anger wasn't self-centered. It wasn't self-promoting. It wasn't self-protecting. It was selfless. Let me ask you a question. Do you think Jesus was ever betrayed? Do you think he was ever criticized? Do you think anybody ever hated on Jesus? Of course. But when you read the biographies of Jesus, you will see that he never got angry when someone criticized him. He didn't get angry when someone disagreed with his views. He didn't get angry when someone posted something he didn't like. Jesus got angry when other people were hurting have any of you uh, taken the Enneagram before? Uh, if you don't know what the Enneagram is, it's a personality test that helps you understand why you behave and respond in certain ways to the events in your life. Uh, I am an Enneagram 8, uh, which for those of you who know the Enneagram, this is not a surprise for you. Uh, eights are aggressive. Um, they're self-confident, strong, and assertive. They're direct, resourceful, uh, protective, and uh, decisive, and maybe a little divisive. Um, but the underlying emotions for eights, what they say is the current that runs underneath of us, is anger. And I've joked before is that anger is pretty much the only emotion I feel. When I'm sad, it comes out as anger. When I'm anxious, I'm angry when I'm angry, I'm angry when I'm happy, I'm probably angry. And for years, I was told that that anger was wrong. For years, I was told I needed to get rid of that emotion. But as I've spent more time reading scripture, as I've dug into the depths of my mental and emotional health, I have learned that my anger comes from a place of wanting to help and love and care for other people. And when I am healthy, and that's the key. When I am healthy, this anger leads to intentionality and empathy and care. Ultimately, it leads to creating a space for others to have a safe place to experience God in faith. But when I am unhealthy, the anger that I feel for justice and caring for lost and broken people quickly turns into anger because I'm being selfish and I'm truly only caring about myself and focusing on myself and how I feel. It becomes anger when I'm impatient because I'm feeling inconvenience, or it's anger because someone said some things that I know aren't true, but I feel the need to fight them, or it's anger because I'm struggling to accomplish what I feel like I need to accomplish as a dad and as a pastor and as a husband. And so a few years ago, when talking to my therapist about this, not getting rid of anger, but trying to figure out this balance of anger, he told me one of the things I needed to do was called an anger audit. And an anger audit is when, you, when you're constantly feeling angry or you're seeing your anger play out in unhealthy ways, you take a step back, right? you check yourself, and you ask, why do I feel this way? Right? Why do I feel this way? What's actually happening inside of me that's making me angry right now? Where is it that I'm carrying a grudge? Where is it that I'm easily agitated? Where do I find myself being extra critical of people or even a little bit hateful when I should be loving? This winter, in a bout of anger, one of my friends asked me, and where do you see this showing up in other areas of your life? Right? Do an anger audit. And if you do that and you take the time to try to figure this out and you find out uh, through this anger audit that you're mad because of what someone said or did to you, you have to make sure it doesn't lead to sin. And this is how you do that. Uh, because when someone hurts you, let's say they lie about you, mistreat you, take advantage of you, or betray you, it's very natural to get upset. It's a natural response to feel anger. That's okay. But the Bible is very clear that for people who follow Jesus, that when someone wrongs us, we're called not to take revenge, not to hate those people, not to let that anger we feel turn into sin, but we're called to forgive them. And we can't forget that. You are allowed to be angry, but you are also called to forgive. And believe me, I'm like a lot of you. When people take shots at me or, or hurt me, I want to fight them I, emotionally, verbally, Physically, I want to fight people like all the time. I have anger issues. I'm working on them, right? I, I want to be angry and I want to feel justified in that anger. But if we jump back to Ephesians and what Paul wrote to that church when talking about anger, he, he said this a few verses later. He said, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. And said, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another just as God through Christ has forgiven you. And I don't know about you, but I've been forgiven of so much. And so if I find myself feeling angry for weeks at a time or months at a time or years at a time or something someone did to me or didn't do or said about me or didn't say, as a follower of Jesus, at some point, 
I have to take a step back and ask God to heal my heart, right? Because this is about me. It's not about them. And I have to help, ask God to help me forgive people because I've been forgiven, because I don't want my anger to lead to sin. And so Jesus wasn't angry about what others did to him. Jesus was angry about how others were mistreated. And when our anger becomes about us, we have to do an audit. We have to check ourselves and, and constantly extend forgiveness to people so that we don't live in that emotional state, so we don't carry that from day to day to day. Here's the second thing we see from Jesus, and this actually comes from a pastor named Albert Tate. He points out that when Jesus got angry, he flipped tables, but he didn't flip people. Right? He didn't flip anybody off. He didn't cuss anybody out. He didn't hurt people because he was upset with them. Jesus flipped the tables because the tables represented the system that supported the hypocrisy and mistreatment of others. Now, here's the thing, though. Whenever we feel strongly about something, it's really easy to feel like our perspective is the right perspective, right? Like the table we're flipping, tables we're flipping are the right tables, but just because we feel strongly about something doesn't necessarily mean we're right. And some of you are arguing with me right now. You're not always right. It's okay. Um, think about the last two years. I'm going to throw out some buzzwords, see how you feel about these. COVID, masks, vaccines, Biden, Trump, Washington commanders, okay? Uh, <laughs> and I could be wrong. I don't, I don't think I am. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that many of you have strong opinions about these things, and these strong opinions and feelings have led to anger, but specifically anger toward people who disagree with you. And you probably felt like your anger was righteous. And again, like I said, I could be wrong. But people on both sides of these topics feel righteously right. But we all know that we can't both be 100% right. It's impossible. And so please hear me. So many people in their effort to be right have forgotten to be loving. And instead of flipping tables, they flip people. They hurt people, they, they, they demean people, they throw away community because of their anger. Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians said, and now these three things remain, faith, hope, and being right. And the greatest of these is being right, you wish. Uh, right, he says, these three things remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. And so we have to make sure that when we are angry, we don't let it convert into unrighteous anger that justifies unloving behavior. Right? Our goal as Christians is not to be right. Our goal as Christians is to always be loving. And so we see that with Jesus. Jesus flipped tables, but he didn't flip people. The third thing is this. When Jesus got angry, he turned that energy into love and care for those who are hurting. Right? Let's think back to the story. Who was it that couldn't worship in the temple? It was the poor, the marginalized, the blind, the sick, the outcast, the under-resourced. And so Jesus flipped over the tables and then he helped the people who his anger burned for, right? That's why Matthew put that one weird verse in there. In verse 14, he says, the blind and lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Like, this wasn't just a table flipping moment. This was a people loving moment. And Jesus didn't just express his anger and say that one thing and walk away, right? He doesn't flip tables and quote scripture and turn his back on everything he serves, he did something in a way that brought healing and support and care. In fact, if you look carefully at the four biographies of Jesus, every time you see Jesus get angry, you won't see him yelling. You won't see him typing a critical post. He doesn't get passive aggressive. He never says, I'm leaving the church, right? Every time you see him get angry, you see him help or heal someone. Every time. And so we have to ask ourselves, what do we do when we get angry? Right, do we sin? Do we hurt others? Do we hold on to it forever? Or do we love and care for those who are hurting? In other words, do we actually do something with that anger? You know, one of the reasons I love this church is because you are a very passionate group of people who care a lot about the things that matter. Uh, so many of you get angry and you fight against pornography and the damage that it does on relationships and marriages. So many of you fight against racism. You fight for resources for our recovery community and you fight to feed people who are food insecure in Frederick. You fight for those who are suffering from mental illness and you continue to try to elevate them and give them a voice. You hear things on the news like what's happening in Ukraine and your heart breaks for those people, right? And you don't just feel angry, 
You don't just post things on social media because you know that doesn't actually make a difference. You get on your knees and you pray for peace and for people you've never met because the idea of them being attacked pisses you off. Right? You seek out organizations that you can financially support that help refugees and restoration and really try to create solutions. And so many of you serve and give and invite here to this church because you care about the people that are far away from God and you want to make sure that they know that there is a church where they can belong. Right? Not a church that puts up barriers or walls, not a church that takes advantage of them, but one that feels like home. And so one of the reasons why I love this church is because you take that energy you have and you turn it into love and care for people who are hurting. But when talking about anger, the thing I'm most thankful for is that Jesus is not like me when it comes to anger, that Jesus is emotionally healthy because if anyone had the right to take his anger out on us, it would have been Jesus. Check this out. Paul writes this in 1 Thessalonians 5. He says, for God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not pour out his anger on us. Ultimately, Jesus chose to save us instead of pouring out his anger on us. Anger because of our sin, right? Because we choose our own way over God's, because we make decisions out of unhealthy places and that hurts other people. I mean, think about it. Jesus had every right to be angry. He had to die on a cross for our mistakes, for our sins, not his, he was perfect. But instead of anger, he chose grace. And instead of anger, he chose mercy. And instead of anger, he chose forgiveness. Instead of anger, he chose caring and loving us. And so for those of you here that don't follow Jesus or you've been struggling with your faith, here's the thing that we want you to know more than anything else. Jesus isn't mad at you. God isn't angry at you, he's just not. Yes, he feels anger when it comes to our sin because our sin separates us from God. But true to who he is, he doesn't take it out on us. Instead, his heart breaks for us. And in the anger he feels for wanting things to be right again, he did something about it. He gave up his own life so that we could be forgiven. And so if you don't follow Jesus, right, and you are struggling with anger, this is where you start. Right, you start with him, because the truth is, you can take these things that we talked about today, but if Jesus isn't at the center of it, it's really not going to make that big of a difference in your life. It's just not. And so if you don't follow Jesus, our challenge for you this week, to start with this, is start with taking a step toward him, putting your faith in him. And if you're ready for that, if you want that, you know, we say this every week, we want you to check the baptism box and your digital connection card so we can talk about what does it look like for you to move forward with Jesus leading the way, when it comes to your healthy emotional state that you're trying to get to. And so listen, and this is really important, anger is a normal feeling. Right? You don't have to feel bad because you feel that feeling. You are allowed to feel anger. It was created by God and felt by Jesus. But what truly matters for us as we try to become emotionally healthy is the question of how do we respond to our anger? Do we hold on to it? Do we carry it for years? Does it lead to sin or does it lead to life? Let's pray. God, I can only speak for myself, um, but anger is something I feel every day. God, I, I feel it throughout the day. I, I feel it um, deep in my soul. And it's something that, um, that I want to be healthy and so, God, as we, as we read Scripture, as we read your word, uh, God, we see how, how your son dealt with anger in this loving and caring and healthy way. God, God, I pray for me personally that I can move toward that. God, not, not hiding my anger, not pretending like I don't feel those feelings, but figure out how do I make this productive and healthy? How do I use it to fuel my care for other people and not tear myself down and other people down? So God, I pray for anybody else who feels that, who feels that way, who, who uh, knows that they're gonna leave today and go try to get lunch and something's gonna set them off. God, that they take a step back and they try to figure out where is this coming from? Why do I feel this way? And what can Jesus do with this? And so God, I, I pray this week as things <laughs> make us mad, because they will, uh, God, we're gonna feel it. God, I pray we remember these words. God, that it doesn't lead us to sin. It doesn't give the devil a foothold. And ultimately, we see and understand how you loved and cared for people through that anger. And God, I, I pray that that's what our anger does. 
It burns for injustice. It burns for people who need love and care. It burns for people who are lost and far from you. And God, at the end of the day, the thing that we are most thankful for is that you didn't take your anger out on us. God, that, that we choose our own way, that we sin. Um, God, we think we, are, are, we think we know better than you do, and that separates us from God, and, and that bothers you. But instead of punishing us, you sent your son to live a perfect life and die on a cross so that we could experience salvation. God, you took that anger you felt and you, you did something about it. God, we're just so thankful for that. God, we love you and pray these things in your name. Amen.